Hello class. Um, today we're going to discuss OCD related disorders. Um, so disorders containing obsessions and compulsions. Um, and just a minute. Let me share with you my screen. I guess we're gonna have to do it this way. Okay. All right. So obsessive compulsive related disorders. Obsessive compulsive and related disorders um, include obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD as it's generally known, um, body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding disorder, and trichotillomania. So obsessive compulsive disorder includes repetitive thoughts and urges or obsessions. So it's a thought that keeps repeating, that won't stop, um, and it becomes an obsession because the person can't stop thinking about it. And it also includes re repetitive behaviors and mental acts or compulsions. So the obsessions are the thoughts and the compulsions are the behavior that result from the thoughts um, or the mental acts that, that occur from the thoughts. And um, what I mean by mental act is counting in your head or praying or doing things that are repetitive, that are compulsive, that are thoughts. Um, but you're, it's an action, if that makes sense. And we're going to discuss body dysmorphic disorder, which is based on repetitive thoughts and urges about personal appearance um, and distorted thoughts about physical appearance. And we're going to also discuss hoarding disorder, which includes repetitive thoughts about possessions um, and trichotillomania or hair pulling in a distressed state. So these are all anxiety related behaviors and because they, they're, you know, they're, the thoughts are obsessive, the person is keyed up, they're on edge and they usually have a lot of energy, particularly around the obsessions or the compulsions. So obsessive compulsive disorder, um, as we mentioned before, is comprised of obsessions and compulsions. So an obsession is an intrusive, persistent, and uncontrollable thought or urge that's experienced as irrational. So some of the most common are being con contamination, so fearful of germs um, all the time, um, fearful of illness, um, because of those germs, sexual and aggressive impulses, and body issues. And the compulsions are an impulse to repeat certain behaviors or mental acts to, to avoid distress. So the person will have an obsessive thought and then they need to act on it in a certain way. The examples include cleaning, counting, touching, or checking. And it's extremely difficult to resist the impulse and may involve elaborate behavioral behavioral rituals and um, compulsive gambling, eating, etc., is not considered a compulsion because it's pleasurable. So it's different from an addiction um, in the sense that, you know, addictions typically um, form around pleasure and stimulating the pleasure response. Um, whereas this compulsion is an act that is, is really just to avoid the distress or abate the anxiety and, um, so yeah, so when we talk about rituals, it could be that they have to flick the light on and off 10 times before leaving the room or something bad will happen, or maybe it's touching a shoe, touching the, the wall 10 times, checking the lock 10 times, washing hands 10 times, and then leaving, something like that. Um, and it gets in the way of, of a person's life and interferes with their ability to function and work, school, or personal relationships, or all of those. So the DSM-5 for uh, criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder is A, the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. And as we mentioned, obsessions are defined by recurrent, intrusive, persistent, unwanted thoughts, urges, or images that the person tries to ignore, suppress, or neutralize. So this is not, we've all had what I guess people in lay terms would say an OCD moment, like, I forgot to turn off my curling iron, but I'm not sure that I forgot to turn the tr curling iron off. So I'm gonna go home, even though I'm 20 minutes away, to go turn my curling iron off. Not saying I've ever done that, people. Okay, maybe I have, but you know, it's like 
something, you know, we've, we can all sort of relate in some way, but this is absolutely different. This is not, did I forget to turn the oven off and I need to go back and check. This is, I know rationally I turned the oven off and I need to go back and check 20 times. And it interferes with my ability to make it to my meeting because I was so anxious that I had to engage in, a, in an elaborate ritual to calm myself down. Um, so they, they try to neutralize the anxiety, ignore the anxiety, or they repress the thoughts, urges, or images um, and neutralize them with a thought or action by compul um, performing a compulsion. And of course, compulsions are defined by those repetitive behaviors or thoughts that a person feels compelled to perform to prevent distress or a dreaded event that a person feels driven to perform in response to an obsession. Example, hand washing, ordering, checking, or mental acts, praying, counting, repeating words, etc. The aims are act are the acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing a dreaded event or situation, but they're not connected in any realistic way with what they're designed to neutralize or prevent, or they're excessive. So me turning the lights off and on 30 times is not going to keep me safe from getting hit by a car today. That's what it means by the ritual is not connected in reality to the event, um, or it's excessive. So um, maybe, um, I, I have an obsession about having, um, uh, neatly ironed clothing. Um, and so I iron all my clothes, but then I realized that there's one crease in one of the shirts. So I have to re iron all of the shirts. Um, so it's not really connected, but even if it is, it's extreme. Um, and the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming. So they require at least an hour a day or cause clinically significant stress or impairment. Again, you're not able to participate in life the way that you would like to because of these obsessions or compulsions. And so you wanna specify if the person has good or fair insight, meaning they know that they're, they're having obsessive thoughts and compulsions and they're acting on them. Um, Oh, and, but you also want to specify if they have poor insights. So maybe they're having these obsessions and compulsions, but they truly believe that if they don't flick the light 30 times, that they could get hurt that day. Whereas the person with good or fair insight knows realistically that flicking the light 30 times is not going to keep them safe, but they, they, they do it anyway because it helps ease their anxiety. And with absent insight or delusional beliefs. So even further lacking insight and having some delusions. You also wanna specify if it's tick related. So if an individual has a current or past history of tick disorder. Okay. Obsessive compulsive disorder develops either before age 10 or during late adolescence or early adulthood more common in women, it's 1.5 times more common than in men. Um, and OCD is often chronic, so only 20% um, completely recover. 75% have a comorbid anxiety disorder. 66% um, have major depression. And 33% have hoarding symptoms, and substance abuse is common. So some of the reasons behind um, obsessive compulsive disorder is operant reinforcement. So compulsions are negatively reinforced by the reduction of anxiety. So yeah, that behavioral trigger of getting the, the anxiety reduced continues the cycle of having those compulsions because they know that if they do the compulsion, it helps ease the anxiety. Um, and then there are cognitive factors, a lack of satiety signal, so yada sentience is a subjective feeling of completion or knowing that we all have, but knowing that you have, like knowing you've thought enough or cleaned enough or completed a task enough. Um, and if, if individuals with OCD have a yada sentience deficit. So we all kind of have that feeling of, I've completed this paper, or I know that this room is clean enough for me, but um, people with OCD kind of have a lack of, of yada sentience, um, which is a fun word, yada sentience, kind of like Yoda, yoda sentience. No, 
doesn't make sense. Okay, moving right along. Um, attempts to suppress intrusive thoughts. So um, the behavioral and cognitive factor is that they're, they're attempting to suppress those intrusive thoughts, but by trying to suppress the thoughts, they may make them worse. Like if you take a moment with me, think about um, something that itches and try to, it's kind of like if you have a mosquito bite and you're trying not to scratch it and you are not thinking about it, not thinking about it, not thinking about it. Oh my gosh, I have to scratch, right? Because you're, you are trying not to think about it, but you're suppressing the thoughts, which really make, means you're putting attention on it and you are thinking about it, which makes it worse. So um, that's tough. That's something that people with OCD struggle with. So treatment of obsessive compulsive related disorders include medications. Medications can help a lot, SSRIs or tricyclic antidepressants. Explo uh, exposure plus response prevention. So not performing the ritual exposes the person to the full force of the anxiety prov provoked by the stimulus. And the exposure results in the extinction of the conditioned response, the anxiety. So it's kind of like, um, through therapy and talking things out and trying something new, the person will um, actually feel the feelings instead of trying to suppress them, maybe in a safe environment or at home with the guidance and help of a counselor. Um, so they are not performing the ritual, they're feeling the feelings, maybe they have some extra coping skills on ways to manage anxiety during that time, and then they learn that they didn't die, it turned out okay, and maybe it wasn't as bad as they thought, and if they keep practicing that, it can get better. And cognitive therapy to challenge beliefs about anticipated consequences of not engaging in the compulsions. Um, and it does usually involve exposure. So moving on to body dysmorphic disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder is, um, pre it's a, it means a person's preoccupied with an imagined or exaggerated deficit in appearance. So they perceive themselves to be ugly or monstrous um, women focus on skin, hips, breast, and legs. Men focus on height, penis size, body hair, and muscular, mus muscularity, excuse me. Um, but I'm saying masculinity because it seems like these are the things sort of associated with stereotypical masculinity. Same thing with the women, um, you know, body shape, um, uh, skin, hips, you know, breasts, legs, etc. So, um, they, and they engage in compulsive behavior, so they may check their appearance in mirrors often or camouflage their appearance with tanning, makeup, plastic surgery, etc. There are high levels of shame, anxiety, and depression in people with body dysmorphic disorder, um, which really makes me think about the possibility of an inverse relationship between trying so, so hard and feeling good about yourself. So it doesn't seem like the things they're doing, tanning, makeup, plastic surgery, are really helping them feel that great about themselves. It occurs slightly more often in women. And I would imagine that has to do with living in a, in a society where female beauty is um, lauded and there's, there are sort of some unrealistic expectations and images um, out there in the media that women are trying to live up to. And there's a 2% prevalence rate um, in the general population and 5 to 7% for women seeking plastic surgery. So as you can imagine, you're going to have more people with body dysmorphic disorder in a plastic surgeon's office than maybe in the general public. Nearly all have another comorbid disorder. And so again, it's the preoccupation with a perceived defect or a markedly excessive concern over a slight defect in appearance. Um, the person has, this is the DSM-5 information here. The person has performed repetitive behaviors or mental acts, mirror checking, seeking reassurance or excessive grooming in response to appearance concerns. Oops. And the preoccupation is not restricted to concerns about weight or fat. So if it was about weight or fat, then you would, maybe be looking at an eating disorder of some sort. This is about other things as well. Body dysmorphic disorder criteria. So again, preoccupation with one or more perceived defects or flaws in physical appearance that are not observable or appear slight to others. 
At some point during the course of the disorder, the individual has performed repetitive behaviors. The preoccupation causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of important functioning. The appearance preoccupation is not better explained by concerns with body fat or weight in an individual whose symptoms meet diagnostic cr criteria for an eating disorder. So the preoccupation, so um, clinically significant distress or impairment might include being, you know, bankrupt or being in a lot of debt because you're having plastic surgery a lot, not wanting to go out in public when you're not feeling good enough about your appearance, um, and different things like that. You want to specify if the person has body dysmorphia with muscle dysmorphia, with good or fair insight, with poor insight, or with absent insight or delusional beliefs. So um, again, do they know that it's irrational? Do they know that what they're, they're seeing in the mirror is not necessarily a reflection of reality? Or are they totally unaware that that's happening? And that they, they really truly think they're monstrously, hideously ugly. How sad is that? Um, body dysmorphic disorder behavioral and cognitive factors include a focus on details of appearance. Um, so there's no actual distortion of physical features. This is not someone who actually has a disability that they're obsessing over or, um, you know, some sort of dis disformation um, that they, they can't get past. Um, they attend to physical attractiveness, features, example, facial symmetry. Um, they miss the gestalt or the whole picture. Like they're so focused on, like if I'm looking here and I'm seeing that I'm not totally symmetrical, which I am not, um, but then I obsess over that. I can't look at the whole picture um, and accept myself. That's kind of what, what it is. Like they're obsessing over an eyebrow and they're not seeing their whole face. Um, they become engrossed in small flaws and they believe in an exaggerated importance of appearance. Okay, moving on to hoarding disorder. Hoarding disorder is a, um, a disorder that involves not being able to part with acquired objects. So some of you may have seen the show Hoarders. Um, basically what the show is, is it's about is interventions for people with hoarding disorder. Um, but basically people collect things, they buy things, and they never throw anything away. So they may be living in homes with 20 years of newspapers stacked high or um, even trash, clothes, anything and everything you can think of. Um, and most of the objects are worthless. They're extremely attached to the objects and they're resistant to relinquishing the objects. And 66% are unaware of the severity of the problem. So it may impact their lives. Um, and people may not want to go to their homes or they may tell them, hey, it's a problem, but they're not really aware of it. 33% um, engage in animal hoarding. So this can be really troublesome because the animals sometimes receive inadequate care. Um, and that's, that's obviously a tough situation. And there are severe consequences like squalid living conditions and it negatively impacts relationships because people probably don't want to stay in their house or come over um, or they won't, won't want to live in a place like that themselves. And if someone has a true hoarding disorder, it may be very difficult for them to change this aspect of themselves. So the criteria includes a, pers a persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value this difficulty is due to the perceived need to save the items and to, dis to distress associated with dis and the dis sorry and the distress associated with discarding them. So they have a perceived need to save the items and they're very distressed throwing things away. The difficulty discarding possessions results in the accumulation of possessions that congest and clutter active living areas and com compromise their intended use. If living areas are uncluttered, it is only because of interventions of third parties like family members, cleaners, or authorities. The hoarding causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, including maintaining a safe environment for themselves. Hoarding is not attributable to another medical condition like brain injury or cerebrovascular disease or Prader-Willi syndrome. 
The hoarding is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder, like obsessions and OCD, decreased energy and major depressive disorder, delusions and schizophrenia, or another psychotic disorder, cognitive deficits and major cognitive disorder, restricted interest in autism spectrum disorder. So the hoarding is very specific and unto itself. It is not because someone's too depressed to clean. It's that they're true, there's distress getting rid of items, all items, not meaningful items. And um, it's, it's hard for them to let go. You want to specify if if it's with excessive acquisition and if discarding possessions is accompanied by excessive acquisition of items that are not needed or for which there's no available space with good or fair insight with poor insight with absent insight or with delusional beliefs so um, where does hoarding disorder come from it may be uh, linked to an evolutionary perspective so when um, young early humans were out in the wild um, hunting for food, they would possibly not, you know, they, they might get a good kill and not get another kill for another 30 days or so. And so they might have to use every single part of that animal or hold on to every single thing that could be of worth or value um, in order to survive. And um, as we know in the brain, we can sometimes, um, go into that fight or flight mode and not be able to tell the difference between what is truly needed to be held on to for survival and what is not that what's okay to let go but it could be from that deep evolutionary fear um, there's also cognitive behavioral factors like poor organizational abilities unusual beliefs about possessions or avoidance behaviors like avoiding cleaning because it's so out of control although that would be more attached to MDD because this really is about not letting go of the things that, that they have in their home. All right, moving on to trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is derived from the Greek word trick, which means hair, tillin or tillo to pull, and mania, madness or frenzy, which is mania. So the disorder is characterized by the chronic compulsion of pulling out one's own hair. And it's an impulse control disorder along with kleptomania, pyromania, and pathologic gambling. So it's like compulsive need to pull hair. It's part of obsessive compulsive spectrum. And the trend towards a higher rate of OCD in families with patients of trichotillomania. So there's a genetic component there possibly a learned one as well. So um, it was first described in, in 1889 and in 1914, the epidemic of hair pulling in an orphanage in, in England. There's a lifetime prevalence of one to 3%, bimodal age onset of five to eight years in early adolescence, but average onset is 11 to 13 years. It waxes and wanes in severity and preschool aged children zero to six years separate entity and natural course compared with trichotillomania and older children and adults. So it accompanies the comorbid habit disorders such as scratching, skin picking, and thumb sucking that occurs around bed or nap time. Here's the criteria for trichotillomania. A, a recurrent pulling out of one's hair resulting in noticeable hair loss an increasing sense of tension immediately before pulling out the hair or when attempting to resist the behavior. So this is very similar to the obsession compulsion pattern, whereby a person is obsessed with a thought and in order to calm the thought, they engage in the compulsive behavior. Well, there's an increased sense of tension for the person who's, who has trichotillomania before pulling their hair out or when attempting to resist pulling their hair out. There's pleasure, gratification, or relief when pulling out the hair. The disturbance is not better accounted for by another mental disorder and is not due to a, to, to a general medical condition. The disturbance causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social occupation or other important areas of functioning. So that's all I have for you today. Um, it's obsessive compulsive disorder, body dysmorphia, trichotillomania, and hoarding. I um, hope you have a good day and stay tuned. There's more where that came from. 
Have a great day.